Welcome to panel two on uh, pathways to decarbonization, the role of technology and science. My name is Marilyn Brown, and I'm the Brooke Byers Professor of Sustainable Systems at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I'm also in my second term as a presidential appointee to the board of directors of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the nation's largest public power provider. So I have a few, wear a few hats. Um, so in keeping with the theme of this year's C3E symposium, the role of women internationally in decarbonizing our energy future, uh, our panelists are three women who are global leaders in clean energy. Um, we have Peng Chen first, on my left, a professor at the Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics, a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and an expert in hydrogen storage for mobile applications. She is also an international C3E ambassador. Uh, Hilly Antila is uh, the chief technology officer of the Fortum uh, Corporation headquartered in Finland and is an expert on grid integration, particularly of large scale uh, renewables, but also demand side management. Uh, and she too is an international ambassador for clean energy. And finally, we have uh, rounding out the panelists, Wanda Reeder, who is the chief uh, strategy officer of uh, SNC Electric Company in Chicago and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. She has also served with me on the Department of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee and she launched the IEEE Smart Grid, um, which enjoys over 90,000 followers. I'm just picking a little pieces of their bios out. We could go on much, much longer, but incredible women here to talk with us. So uh, C3E came about uh, from a recognition of the many subtle and nuanced ways that women's participation in the field of energy science and technology uh, is um, challenged. While women have made many strides um, in clean energy science and technology, the innovation ecosystem is flawed. It's not taking full advantage of our capacities. And as uh, Rebecca Pearl Martinez said, uh, all hands are not yet on deck. The establishment of C3E uh, is grounded in a commitment to close this gender gap, to empower women to overcome these barriers. Um, and I had uh, wanted to begin my few remarks with a couple of personal anecdotes to provide some context for perhaps how we've gotten to where we are in terms of seeing so few women of power in, um, in the United States um, and are in a rising tide of uh, up and comers here in the room. But what was it about uh, this innovation ecosystem that made it so difficult when I was coming through? And you might be able to reflect on some of these in thinking about your own careers. So first, uh, when I was a PhD student at The Ohio State University, I was a, a modeler, a, a mathematical quantitative social scientist and policy analyst. So I was modeling the uh, diffusion of energy innovations. It was post-Arab oil embargo, and I wanted to see what we could do to try to displace our reliance on petroleum fuels. And you know, I wanted to get my PhD. I kept coming across comments from both professors and friends and family, that the state of Ohio spending its presidential four-year dissertation fellowships on me was a very big risk because I was probably just gonna go get married and have children, right? Okay, so I persisted. I didn't have any children at that point, so it wasn't a problem, but you know, we need to be ready with clear answers and today it's certainly easier to get your PhD and have children as has certainly happened with my PhD students. So then I go to take an assistant professorship position at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And you know, I do, do pretty well in the Department of Geography. There is no maternity leave. I do have a child at that point and I used up all of my sick days. And my salary is kind of slipping relative to the new hires coming in. So I go to my chair and I say, 
Um, shouldn't there be a little gender equity adjustment to my salary? And I get the answer, well, you know, your husband is teaching in civil engineering. The salaries there are really high, and my faculty are all men, and they are single bread earners, you know. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but in the interest of family, um, family betterment, we cannot give you a raise, so. Well, I, I persisted and I, you know, I got my tenure. I didn't fight it too much. Um, then left, <laughs> gave my tenure, and went to Oak Ridge National Laboratory with my husband. We had nice joint uh, job offers. And then I learned, I was told by many of my colleagues that um, it was generally assumed that I was hired in order that Oak Ridge National Laboratory could secure the employment of my husband. So now I've got to carry that around with me. Okay, so, well, I know I didn't let that uh, get in my way. I mean, you know, we, here we are, the Ginger Rogers dancing on heels backwards. We just keep going, persist, persist. By the time, um, you know, I left, I had uh, spent 10 years in charge of the uh, energy efficiency, renewables, and electric grid program and was uh, tied with Michelle Buchanan as the highest ranking female at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. But you know, it was a tough slog. When I did leave, I now had a reputation and people were coming after me. So it was no longer a problem of who am I? Am I just Frank's wife? You know, the one that's gonna leave and have babies. Um, so I go to Georgia Tech and uh, I set up the clean energy, uh, the climate energy policy lab and there created a pretty good critical mass of graduate students, half of whom are female, and two of whom are in the room here. Caroline and Xiao Jing, you're here somewhere, aren't you? Yep, yep. And one thing I learned when uh, at, at uh, Georgia Tech was that there is this need for critical mass. You don't want to be the uh, one female dropped onto a board or dropped into a corporate structure or leadership team or faculty and have to do it on your own. That is really uncomfortable. So finding a place that has some women that you can work with is, I think, a big key to success. I did want to talk a little bit sort of about these dual career situations because I know some of you are at that point in your career where you're having to negotiate uh, jobs jointly for you and your spouse. So it's, it can be done, persist. I think that that's a, a certainly what I learned. Now, I challenged uh, each of the other panelists to come up with stories. I don't know if they have, but I've given them some time now and some ideas. But I know they're also going to talk about science and technology. So the panel is going to explore the latest advances in science and technology in decarbonizing the uh, energy sector. Some technologies and solutions that we uh, need are, all, are already in hand today. So one question for you all is, what are these, um, these accomplishments that have occurred in your field that represent breakthroughs? Um, there is a rising tide of ingenious solutions, insight. What are these breakthroughs that really, we really need to be able to go further toward that deep decarbonization? And then finally, um, what co-benefits or unintended consequences do you foresee in your field or outside of your field being created by a transition to a clean energy economy? So those are the questions for our panelists. I'd like to start first with Ping Chen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And it's my first time to join the C3E um, Symposium. And um, uh, I'm, I'm a professor in the Institute of Chemical Physics. And um, before I uh, talk my research, I probably I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. Um, um, I, I was in the uh, chemistry department um, in PhD students. And uh, I'd like to say that um, I, my uh, career is somehow is it's not uh, managed by myself. <laughs> on, on when I was a PhD student, I, I conducted research and I accidentally found something very interesting. And those things are carbon nanotubes. When I 
that, that was the 1990s. So come down to be still very hot topic, very hot material. And before I graduate, I, I met on a professor from Singapore, National University of Singapore, and he's very, he was very interested in that, uh, um, that, that study, and he invited me to be postdoctor in to that university. So I got my first job, postdoctor there. I haven't applied for that, but they, um, they, you know, they, you know, inter they were interested in the, in the material we, uh, we studied. And after that, um, also by accidental funding, I, I got very interesting data from uh, uh, carbon with lithium, and we found that those materials can absorb hydrogen. And at that time, I have no idea how, how, what hydrogen storage could be that important for nowadays technology. But at that time, I'm just purely a, of scientific interest. Then, um, led by this uh, scientific funding, I moved on to hydrogen storage. And um, uh, after spend, spending almost 11 years in Singapore, and I, I met a um, um, director from Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics in a conference, and he, he, he listened to my talks, talk, and he, he invited me to, to join his institute. So I, yeah, I joined, joined Dalian Institute of Chemical in, uh, Physics. So it seems um, I didn't plan uh, uh, for that, but uh, uh, my research seems uh, led me, lead me to, from this place to other places. And back to our research, um, um, as Marilyn mentioned that hydrogen, uh, we have been in hydrogen storage for 70 years. And um, um, probably you know that uh, hydrogen is in gaseous form, and if you want to use hydrogen in your car as, a, as a fuel, you, you have to compress hydrogen, or you have to liquefy the hydrogen, or you can store hydrogen in your mat solid material, either by physical way or by chemical way. And our research is by storing hydrogen in chemi chemically in solid material. And before 2000, year 2000, the, major the main focus on material development for hydrogen storage is based on metal and metal alloys. For example, magnesium hydride or nickel nesanum hydride, etc. And um, those um, hydrides have certain uh, advantages, but still they have drawbacks like uh, uh, high temperature to re release hydrogen or low capacity hydrogen storage. So, um, and also by accidental funding, I, not, I, uh, our team uh, noticed that nitrogen containing materials can also absorb hydrogen. So we, 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 we introduced nitrogen to the hydrogen storage material and we established a metal nitride hydrogen system. So by doing so, we can have more um, chemicals or more materials to, to, to be developed for hydrogen storage. And uh, nowadays, um, I have seen that in the, in the past 20 years, tremendous efforts from worldwide has been devo uh, devoted to hydrogen storage, material, uh, storage research, especially for, from Department of Energy. Probably you know that a few years before, uh, there's a very strong program for, in hydrogen storage research. And I am I'm I'm one of the uh, collaborators with Sandia Lashen Laboratories for the research. And I'm also involved in the IPHE hydrogen storage program. But still, um, the challenge is still there. Or, or, although we have been spent 20, more than 20 years in this area, we still couldn't have materials that could meet the practical requirements. For example, if you have material, you could, you could store a lot of hydrogen in that material, but that's not enough. You have to release hydrogen at near ambient condition. You also need your material to be stable, to be reversible, to be recyclable. And by doing all these things, nowadays still none of the material can, can do the job. So it's the challenge is still there. Mm -hmm. But I, I was foreseeing that if we could have better technology, better, better materials for this, um, for this area, we probably could change the, the system of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Nowadays we have three, 700 bars hydrogen cylinder in our car. This, those, those, those cylinders for storing hydrogen. If we replace 700 bars cylinder by a material only of uh, tens of bars, then it probably will feel much better than that. So that's, uh, that's an uh, answer to uh, Marilyn's question that uh, I will very look, very look forward to the big breakthrough in the materials uh, development engineering. Thank you. Yuli. Yuli, yeah. you want to go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so, thank you very much for this invitation. It's great to be here. And you asked a story. And uh, <laughs> this happened to me just a few months ago in, in, in China. 
uh, I was there uh, visiting Beijing and then, uh, then uh, we agreed that we will visit a coal mine in East Mongolia. And we left there early morning from Beijing at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Then we flew, fl had a flight there about uh, two, three hours. Then we drove with a car uh, a couple of hours. Finally, we were there and, and uh, our hosts gave us, gave us lunch. Then they uh, told us, now you can have some rest. And finally, when it was three o'clock, then they came that now it's time to go to the tour to the mine. But unfortunately, women are not, are not allowed to go to the mine because it brings bad luck to the miners. So, so I made this 15-hour trip there and, mm -hmm. and finally was no, not able to go to the mine. So uh, sometimes you get surprises, but luckily not too often. Um, I'm coming from European Utilities, so I think I'm giving you a brief uh, background of our company Fortum and then uh, about our development activities toward uh, the uh, new world. So um, uh, we, are, we have operations in, in uh, Northern Europe, uh, Russia and India. And uh, it has been quite a long time already our target to decarbonize our production. And now we are around one-tenth of the average emissions per produced power unit in, in EU. Uh, what we are doing, for example, we just inaugurated a biomass combined heat and power plant in, in Stockholm, which is one of the biggest ones in, in, in the world. Uh, what I'm very happy is that, that uh, we have just announced our strategy that we want to focus also on wind and solar and to build a gigawatt scale portfolio there. And, uh, we have, uh, for example, wind power project in Russia. I think this is the first one in Russia uh, which we are constructing. And in solar, we are, we are uh, building portfolio in, in India. Just recently won a, a couple of, of uh, auctions. So we will have around 200 megawatts by the end of this year. So I'm very happy that we are going towards renewables. And uh, luckily, the cost of renewables is, is decreasing all the time, so that it, uh, wind and solar, solar really are, in, in very short notice, uh, the cheapest way to produce electricity. And, and uh, that is very good news. On the other hand, uh, it takes a lot of systemic innovation to enable that. So. Um, so we have to find, find ways how to, how to make, make the system work. And there our focus is to find new flexibility source, sources, so to develop uh, customer end and uh, solutions. And uh, we have a couple of examples in uh, electricity consumption. Uh, we have already in the market a product where, where uh, when we have an hourly price, in, uh, in Finland, the customers can, uh, can have the hourly price and then optimize the electricity consumption in their heating based on the market prices. So if we offer this solution for them. And of course, this helps the system, system to, to manage. An another, which is more uh, still in the commercial piloting phase, is that we have uh, aggregated customer water heaters together and then we uh, bring this aggregated load to the market and, and we, uh, we uh, carry out frequency regulation, this fastest regulation market on, on second basis. So I feel that these kind of uh, solutions help renewables to enter the market. Uh, but then it's important to remember, take all the advantage of the of different structures what we have in different markets. So it's not only electricity, it's also heat, traffic, and what we already heard today, also water. And in Nordics, we have a lot of district heat. And, and we are also bringing district heat to help electricity system and increase the demand response activities there. And how can you do that with district heat? It's that uh, you can decide when you produce district heat 
you can uh, produce also electricity with combined heat and power plants, but you can also consume electricity when producing district heat. So it's actually a very important source of, uh, of flexibility to bring flexibility to electricity system. And, and uh, I think, so you can't have a solution that fits all, ma all. you have to find what is the best for different areas and, and then build on that because that is for the society the, the most cost efficient way to do that. Yeah, thank you. All right, Wanda. My turn, huh? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's just so energizing to see all of you here. So it's, it's been a, quite a journey, and to have this many women in one room that supports clean energy is absolutely amazing to me. Uh, I, I'm in Chicago. As Marilyn said, I'm the Chief uh, Strategy Officer at SNC Electric Company, and we manufacture switchgear and protection equipment. So for those of you that have been involved in especially the distribution utility space, you probably know of our gear. But our portfolio has broadened. We have uh, applications that find their way into microgrids and renewable interconnection through our power electronic solutions as well. Uh, so I found uh, my career to be very fascinating. I uh, actually didn't have a grand plan to be in clean energy. Uh, I grew up in a ranch in western South Dakota, had no idea what engineering was at the time, and it was my algebra teacher, who actually was also my rodeo coach, came up to me in the hallway <laughs> once and tapped me on the shoulder and says, you know what, you are so good in math, if I had to do it over again, I would have taken engineering, but I didn't even know it existed when I went to school. So that's how I found my way into engineering and how I found my way into power. I was uh, one student on the Dean's Advisory Council for Engineering at South Dakota State, which Marilyn and I found we have uh, something in common there. But anyway, through that, uh, my last semester before I graduated, uh, one of the gentlemen that was serving on that board was in charge of research and development at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association in Washington, D.C. So, well, I figured if I can live in Washington, D.C. and get back, I could probably get, you know, get by anywhere, which in hindsight was not far from the truth coming from my roots. Uh, but anyway, at NRECA, at the time it was on DuPont Circle, uh, I was collecting all the different research that they were funding at the time and found, first of all, power to be absolutely fascinating. But then it was, I guess, 85, conservation, load management, uh, demand side al alternatives is, is especially interesting, which launched myself into a career at Northern States Power ComEd and then ul ultimately an uh, uh, Exelon role. So, that's been my utility background. Uh, through there, I've had a tremendous opportunity to learn to bring technologies into the field, whether it's automated meter reading or uh, automation, um, cable testing, uh, unregulated subsidiary, and the list kind of goes on. I've found my passion to be bringing technology into the space. And I happen to hit it just right that, you know, as an industry, we've been going through transformation for a while. And uh, on the bell curve, I was one that liked to do the change management and bring technology in. So it's been tremendously interesting. Uh, I've also uh, been very active in IEEE, which I think has given me a stronger voice than just in my workplace alone. Marilyn mentioned that I uh, led the IEEE Smart Grid Initiative, launched it. Uh, I was also the first uh, president of the Power and Energy Society in 2008 and 2009 as a female. Uh, we changed the name. We, we knew we needed to rebrand it because the demographics was one where we just weren't recruiting. It wasn't only a gender issue. It, it was a demographic issue. Those in their thir 20s, 30s, and even 40s that had been on the decline consistently for 10 years. So we, we knew we had to do some rebranding in order to have sustainability in the society itself. So hence, uh, a significant rebranding effort of which then on the heels came IEEE Smart Grid, uh, new publications along the same lines and sustainable alternative energy, and of course a lot of collaboration along a lot of different uh, disciplinaries in order to pull it off. So I, I lay that out there because I, I wish I could come in here and say I had a grand plan. No, <laughs> I just followed my passion. And I've, 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 I've really enjoyed it along the way. You know, as I, as I go back into the questions that Marilyn asked, uh, they're, they're pretty broad relative to a five-minute spiel, but I kind of boil them down into about four clusters of things. And the first is, we are in a significant transition. 
as an industry. It's huge. You look back five years ago, and you know half of the supply in the United States just from coming from coal. That changed almost overnight. And we as an industry have never changed that fast. So just having the delivery infrastructure in order to have that kind of flexibility was, was significant in itself. And that's only been over a five-year period. Now, as we look forward, there's a whole lot more that we need to do. We've heard the other panels and speakers talk about, you know, we've got a clean energy plan, but does it go far enough? And, you know, if we're really going to stay within the two degrees C, no, we know it doesn't need, to, it, it isn't going far enough. We need to look at the whole technology portfolio, some of which the readiness, we've come a long ways. You know, we, we look at that solar curve and how that cost came down, and the installation rents went up really fast. And we're not done there yet. I mean, you go out in the poster sessions, and there's ideas out there that suggest that the costs are going to even come down more. And that cost curve is also a precursor to storage uh, and others. And I think we're going to have a con kind of a convergence of you know, the solar, the wind, and then the behind the meter opportunities in buildings and transportation that is just offering us a tremendous opportunity. And I think some of the the interesting space, if you will, is, is where these areas of disciplines overlap. Because we, we've learned in silos, we've grown up in organizations that are relatively siloed, and where those edges overlap, a lot of times there's efficiencies that we haven't been able to gain. And actually, I think as women, you know, it, it's a tremendous place for us to excel because generally we're collaborative, we're open to new ideas, uh, we want to solve problems, we want to connect to issues in a, in a much bigger way that we can see relevance to society and mankind. Uh, and boy, if this thing, it, it, this is really what connects, I think, uh, to prosperity overall. So, you know, it's kind of a message, I think, of, you know, how, how do you get to folks? It's tell the story, and the story starts, you know, my rodeo coach in, the, in high school, right? Somebody touches you somewhere along the way. We all have those stories. Uh, but it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. We know that the pipeline is uh, not near what it needs to be. We need to support each other. And uh, I, I agree. You know, I've been a lone, lone voice for a long, long time, but it's a whole lot easier if there's multiple females in the room. So yeah, yeah. here, here to you. I'm glad that we're all in here together, and uh, it's a journey. We'll figure yeah. it out. Okay. Fabulous careers. Thank you for sharing all of that. So that's been about 10 minutes. Uh, any questions from the audience? Some of these terrific uh, participants, and then we'll do a lightning speed kind of round of comments at the end with one surprise question. <laughs> Anyone, a question for any of our panelists? Yeah. I know that um, other companies in Finland are looking at uh, supplying heat for district heating through geothermal. Uh, does your utility have any plans for geothermal heating or combined heat and power projects? Thank you. Uh, actually, actually, there's a project where we are involved. So, so uh, there is a deep, deep geothermal project uh, ongoing. And, and uh, it, it will be in our district heating network area. So, and it might be a disruptive technology. So, so looking forward, how it goes on. I think the Scandinavian countries are pretty much ahead of the U.S. when it comes to managing so much intermittency and putting together the supply side and the demand side and the frequency regulation story you told. I know in Copenhagen they're using uh, the Nissan Leafs students in the middle of uh, you know their classes are helping to line up these the storage capacity and put it back onto the grid when it's needed. So. You know, we can get there too. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. that we're just a little bit behind. I don't know why that is. Do you know? <laughs> I, I think one part of is the electricity market model, mm -hmm. what, we, what we have. Because, because uh, for example, this uh, frequency regulation uh, aggregated business model, it's actually, uh, we are offering that commercially to TSO and it's going according to their procedures. So 
it regulatory model is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, I think that having a, a line of sight with certainty around the business model helps the investment piece tremendously. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of compare and contrast the European activity to the states, and it, you know, if you, especially in an investor-owned utility where you don't necessarily know what the rules are, and you know, different state commissions take different roles relative to the utility leadership, and it, it seems like you know we're finding our way, but there's uh, 50 mm -hmm. journeys at the state level, a little, a little yeah. bit of federal help too. And so, you know, the, the process isn't quite as clean as perhaps from the European model where there's been a plan that's been pretty obvious and, and it, it, that's, I think, allowed investment at faster clip. Mm -hmm. I do have a story to share, though, oh, along great. the community side mm -hmm. while some questions brew up. We just finished a project in, in Ohio, and uh, this is where I think the unusual business model coupled with solar and storage makes this uh, a winner and there was no subsidies involved whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So a, a third party ended up uh, actually putting in a, a solar facility and also a battery and uh, this, they had three different kind of large industrial type uh, companies within their service area and they wanted to get into some renewables. Uh, so they did, it was uh, seven megawatts of storage and you know, uh, on it goes. But the bottom line is that the, you, the little municipality could buy energy back from the solar facility cheaper than what they were getting it otherwise. The battery was used to clip peak about 10, 10 times per year, so their demand costs went down. Uh, they had to do some investment in reactive power anyway, which they were able to defer, so that helped. But the interesting thing is back to the frequency market. It happened to be within PJM's mm -hmm. you know, uh, service area ISO, and they were able to leverage the frequency market. Mm -hmm. So the individual uh, third-party investor is uh, breaking even within three to four years on that project. Nice. Nice. And it's less cost to the municipality. Nice. So I think it just Creative shows packaging. that it's not just technology mm -hmm. alone. Yeah. It's coupling, you know, kind of a community interest with yeah. the market as well. Yeah, great. Was there another uh, question out here? Right there. I have a question about um, storage. And um, I know that at the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, we've partnered with a couple other organizations on different reports um, and different analyses on storage. We did a renewable energy futures project a few years ago where the results showed that we won't need, um, integrating, with integrating renewables into the grid, we won't need storage until there's a pretty high penetration. But when you go to different energy conferences, you don't necessarily hear that. People say, oh, you know, with 20% or, you know, 15%, you're going to need some storage. So I'm wondering what your opinions are about that, because we, we've uh, found in our analyses that, those, that, that that's not true. Well, I think it depends. <laughs> so anybody that's been on there, the models side of this question, it really depends a lot. And you know, to the extent that there's significant renewable penetration, I, we've learned that we can probably get further than what we first thought when we started down the journey. Uh, without storage, but you know we've also seen that there's times when you approach stability challenges, and some storage, especially facts to acting, makes a big difference. Uh, you know, and then you also got to look at the mix that you have. I mean, you got the Upper Northwest that has a lot of hydro, so you, you know it's. I don't think there is one answer. Uh, it's very location specific. Uh, I will say that the planning around this changes a lot because we used to have normal and contingency and we understood what the loads were and what the load growth was. And now with the intermittency and the, the negative aspects of this, I think that we have to learn how to get much better prepared at scenario analysis. And the one thing that st storage does is it provides us some flexibility and nimbleness so that to the extent things happen that are a little unexpected, you know, we got some shock absorber built into the system. Mm -hmm. But I might defer, you know, mm -hmm. some added comments. <laughs> Actually, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, on the other hand, if you think of, of demand uh, response compared to storages, then you don't have to invest in new assets or you think electric vehicles that you can have the vehicle to grid what is now in piloting phase. It's a huge uh, capacity mm -hmm. available. So I think it's, it's balancing that how, how fast you can bring these, uh, these uh, assets into operation where you, you don't actually have to invest uh, again. So um, yeah, yeah, very interesting question. And I think there really isn't uh, exact exact answer for that. Tremendous opportunity on transfer, uh, transportation 
and also buildings and how these intersect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have the, a final question then. I'd like each of you to respond. Uh, what needs to happen to attract more girls and women into the energy sciences and engineering? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm professor um, uh, in the institute. So um, every year I have uh, two or three students join my research group, and you, normally half and half, half boy, half girls. And um, I will say that some of the girls are really, really intelligent, and um, I, I, I did my best to encourage them to continue their um, scientific research after. PhD grade, uh, PhD degree. For example, uh, two of my students um, going uh, uh, continue their their um, scientific training as postdoctors uh, after uh, receiving PhD, and um, two of um, others are uh, jo join uh, as faculty member join universities and st still continue their research. So those girls with very um, right talents in scientific research, I would strongly uh, suggest them to continue their, um, uh, this, this direction because they, they have this talent. But not all the girls uh, have this, uh, have this um, um, capability. But for those who really have this one, but I think that people, you know, conducting research, the, the, the people has to be um, pretty good Persistent. I mean, persistent. And, mm -hmm. and if you you can hold this, uh, uh, your your dream strongly, you probably can uh, uh, go through everything you, you encountered. So uh, those, those girls who have this um, um, characteristics, uh, our characters, I would strongly encourage them to do this. Okay. Really. Right. I, I think we need these role models, and here we have uh, <laughs> hundreds of role models here, and and. I think this, this uh, example of, of how to influence this mentoring, I, I like it very much, and, and we hope that we can bring this to, with, to our Finnish ambassadors and to find out a way to do, the, do mentoring there. So um, I, I think, again, not, not only one, one thing, it's, it's uh, several things. Mm -hmm. I agree, there's no silver bullet. Yeah. But I would boil it down into three things. I think it's telling the story, and that means uh, not only story in the fourth through eighth grade, I mean, that's where it begins, but also along the way. I think that we need to provide a support infrastructure. Uh, there's now getting to be a few of us. It's no longer just a single voice, but that's, uh, we still need a lot of support uh, and kind of affirmation. And the third one is recognize the biases and address them. You know, there, there, there are reality biases in the workforce and along the way, uh, and it, it is what it is, but you know what? Together we can change them. And I, you know, I've been noticing at, at where I work, we're, we're certainly making this front and center. I believe that it's very important for the rate of innovation. Uh, we're moving faster than we ever have before. We need the best and the brightest, and we need, we need the different perspectives. So this is, this is a matter of success. And so, you know, making sure that to the extent there are some resistance elements in the process, we need to acknowledge them and, and put uh, in, infrastructure in place in order to address them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my uh, final comment will be, we also need better textbooks. And I happen to have two that I, one I published this year and one last year, and there are flyers for them on the table up front. One is on energy efficiency policies and markets, and the other is on global energy policy. So they tell a story, and I think they get people excited about the problems and the opportunities, and it's all about getting people excited, men and women. So thank you so much for uh, hearing us out. Thank you.